Hi, uh, I'm Tammy Everts, and I'm here to talk to you about how to use performance budgets to fight regressions in your websites. Um, a little bit about me, uh, I have been working in the performance space for over 10 years and working in usability and user experience for more than 20 years. Um, a lot of the work that I've done in the past decade or so has been focused on the intersection between uh, user experience, performance metrics, and business outcomes. Um, I wrote a book for O'Reilly a few years ago called Time is Money, the Business Value of Web Performance. I'm not trying to plug it here. Um, <laughs> you don't have to run out and buy it unless you really want to. Um, but uh, just to kind of say there's, there's a lot of interesting data out there. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Performance.now conference in Amsterdam every year. I co-curate a repository of web performance and business case studies called WPO Stats. And uh, a little fun fact, I was the original owner of Uber.com, that domain. So if you are wondering how that story ends, you can um, ping me online anytime. Um, so let's get started. I want to start with kind of a scary story. So um, I know this is a morning slot for a lot of folks. So, you know, it'll be daylight. You won't be too horrified by this. But the story is about a company called, um, at the time, Shopzilla. Uh, they were since acquired by another company called Connexity. And a case study that they shared at a performance conference way back in 2009. And the story that they shared was how they worked really, really hard on a performance sprint to improve their average load time. So it had been six seconds. They shaved it down to 1.2 seconds. They saw a really significant increase in their conversion rate and in their page views. It was amazing. They were really happy. It was a wonderful success story. In 2011, they came back and shared another case study at the same conference. And what they shared was how in 2010, they kind of took their eye off the prize. Um, they were busy with other things and they stopped focusing on performance so much and their average load time degraded back to five seconds. And they started to get user feedback. I'm not coming to this site again. They saw a drop in their business metrics and their user experience metrics. And uh, they realized they needed to do another performance sprint. And so in 2011, they came back and they talked about this performance sprint that they had done and how they refocused on performance. And it was kind of early days. They had literally just finished it weeks earlier, but they were already starting to see an increase in, in their conversion rate. The culprits behind why they dropped their focus on performance were kind of the usual culprits, feature development, um, you know, third parties were just starting to be a thing back, back in those days. And so some really poorly implemented third parties kind of waiting too long to tackle problems, relying on performance sprints instead of ongoing uh, performance work. They stopped doing performance measurement completely, and they also just kind of weren't tracking regressions. Really kind of this is, I think of this SpongeBob uh, image when I think about kind of our, our, our lives, and you know, most of us in our day-to-day -day lives are trying to do a lot of different things. That's what happened. And uh, the the, kind of what would have helped the folks at Shopify back in the day were this idea, like if only, if only the idea of performance budgets had been around. And so uh, the idea of performance budgets isn't new. Um, my colleague, Steve Souders, um, who some of you might be familiar with, he's sort of the godfather of web performance. Um, he um, kind of pioneered the term performance budgets in the early days. Um, Tim Cadleck, who uh, you might also have heard of, he wrote about performance budgets way back in 2013. And another performance friend, Harry Roberts, also wrote about performance budgets not that long ago. It's not a new concept, but it's really, um, it kind of is very ephemeral and it means different things to different people. So what I wanna talk about today is just the why and the how of performance budgets. Um, this is a really great quote from Michelle Vu at Pinterest that she shared in a case study um, at uh, the PerfNow conference in Amsterdam back in 2018, where she shared how they uh, at Pinterest decided that they needed to fight regressions and that that needed to take priority over any optimization work. And the reason they decided this was because in the past, I'm just going to read this quote aloud for anyone who um, might be uh, needing to, to look elsewhere. When we had performance efforts, engineers who were working on optimizations couldn't even see their progress in their, in their performance metrics because there were so many regressions happening at the same time. So today we're going to talk about what is a performance budget, 
what metrics you should focus on, how to determine what your budget thresholds should be and how to stay on top of them. So first, what is a performance budget? It's a threshold that you create for metrics that are meaningful for your site. So they're a highly customizable tool and your metrics um, for performance budgets can be time-based. They can be metrics like start render or largest contentful paint. They can be quantity-based. They can be around page size, image weight, long task time, or they can be score-based, uh, your cumulative layout shift score or your lighthouse score. The important thing is that they're numeric and they're trackable. There's a lot of different monitoring tools you can use to capture some or all of these metrics. Um, you're probably familiar with these, but just for anyone who's not, um, real user monitoring, also known as field testing, is when you uh, insert a JavaScript beacon on your page and it captures lots of really um, interesting information about your users from their browsers, and you can learn a lot about your real users. Um, synthetic tools, also known as lab tools, um, they mimic uh, network and browser conditions. So you basically, they're, they're typically online. You can enter URLs from your own site, your competitor site, and uh, kind of test how specific pages would perform under different test parameters, uh, geolocations, uh, browser uh, network, that kind of thing. There are many, many tools that are both free, open source, uh, paid tools. These are a few of them. Um, if you are not already familiar with them, I encourage you to go check them out. But getting back to the idea of performance budget, a good budget will show you what your budget is, when you go out of bounds, how long you're out of bounds, and when you're back within budget. Your budgets can be really passive. You can just sort of look at them in charts or you can set up alerts with them and configure them so that you can get alerts in real time so you can investigate if things are, 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 are going wrong. And you can even have your budgets break the build. So this is an example of a performance budget um, that kind of meets those different parameters. You can see the red line is the budget and you can see when the budget is exceeded. You can see what the budget is for. It's tracking cumulative layout shift. You can see when things get back to normal and you fall within your budget and you can kind of see like, oops, we've, we're, we've exceeded our budget yet again. So you want this level of visibility into all of those different um, ideas. The metrics you should focus on. This is probably the question I get asked most often when I speak with customers and I speak with a lot of speed curve users, a lot of people who um, are new to performance. Just what metrics should I focus on? I wish I could tell you there is one bright, shiny, beautiful unicorn metric that you could use um, and kind of pin all of your performance hopes and dreams on. Unfortunately, there are dozens and dozens and dozens um, and it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed. And uh, like I said, I wish I could tell you that you could just pluck one of these out, but there's a little bit more to it than that. It's really kind of, your unicorn looks more like this. Um, just in, in Speed Curve, in our tools, we have over 50 synthetic metrics. We have over 30 RUM metrics. We have scores of additional metrics that we can track for each third party. And then uh, people have the ability to add their own custom metrics. And so you can see that things can really quickly get really overwhelming if you don't have kind of a North Star to go on. So what I preach to people, especially if they're just getting started with performance budgets is this MVB, also known as minimum viable budgets. And your minimum viable budgets, um, from my perspective, are, should be focused on user experience. Are you able to actually measure what, uh, something that approximates what your real users are experiencing? So that means, is the page loading? Can I use it? How does it feel? So an ideal UX metrics, metric tracks important content. Ideally, it's a really accessible metric with whatever tool you're using. Ideally available in synthetic and RUM. It can be correlated to your UX and business metrics, and it has really broad browser support. So is the page loading? That's a really good question to start with. Backend time is a good metric to consider for that. Um, you can track backend time in synthetic and RUM, so it's a really handy metric to have in your toolkit. 
in if you look at back end time in a film strip and you see here's a waterfall where we can see well back end time there's not really anything showing up in the in the film strip view but that's fine we've got other metrics for that so does it track the most important content no but it fulfills a lot of our other criteria start render is a really great metric i also i i feel like start render sort of it's not cool and sexy anymore, so people don't talk about it as much, but it's available in Synthetic and RUM, and quite often it does actually correlate to something visible in the viewport. And equally important, we can take Start Render and we can correlate it in correlation charts like this to user experience and business metrics. So often when I do create these kinds of charts for people, we can see that as Start Render improves, so does their bounce rate and so does conversion rate. So for my purposes, it checks all of my boxes. Can I use the page? Well. This is a really interesting result from a usability uh, test that I did a while back where we queried people after the usability test, when do you start interacting with a page even? And what we found was really interesting. Just over half of users will not start interacting with a page, that means clicking on the page or scrolling, until most or all images have loaded. So for that reason, it's really helpful to have metrics that track those really large visual elements Largest Contentful Paint, if you are kind of staying up to speed, no pun intended, with Core Web Vitals, you know that it's one of Google's Core Web Vitals. It's a good metric in that it tracks, it's, it's available in Synthetic and RUM, only available in Chromium browsers, so that's a bit of a caveat there. Um, but it does measure when the largest visual content renders. As you can see here in the film strip, that's kind of validating that. It often, but not always, correlates to bounce rate. And so we can see here that, yeah, it's, it's, it's checking a few boxes, broad browser support, which is a pretty important one for me, it doesn't check. And so we want to look past LCP. Last Painted Hero is a really great metric that tracks when the last piece of critical content, so your hero image, largest background image, your first H1 is painted in the browser. It's only available in synthetic, but you can see here that it correlates really well to something being visible in the browser. So yes, it also uh, checks off a, a few key boxes here as well. And it's a nice backup or companion metric for largest contentful paint. So let's talk about how the page feels. Cumulative layout shift is an aggregate score that measures how much page elements shift during rendering, AKA jank. Um, it's another core web vital. It's available in synthetic and run, which is great, but also only in Chromium browsers. You can see all these visuals that kind of show these are the shifting elements on the page and this is how the score is calculated. But what we find when we look at it in the field and try to correlate CLS to bounce rate, the results are really kind of all over the place. So it shows you need to really uh, validate this using your own data. Sometimes the bounce rate gets worse, sometimes it gets better, sometimes it stays the same. So a few boxes checked, but not all. Long task time. So a JavaScript long task is any JavaScript function that takes more than 50 milliseconds to execute. They don't block page rendering necessarily, but they can make the page feel really janky. The lovely thing about long task is they're measurable in synthetic and RUM across browsers. And uh, you can see all the different long tasks and what they are here. So you can see that they're called out and there can be quite a number of long tasks on a page. And so long task is a really great proxy for interactivity because the more long tasks are on a page, the more janky the page can feel. When we look at this in the field, we see that excessive long task time do often correlate to uh, changes in conversions, negative changes to conversions. And your long task time can also expose problems with your third parties. So checks a lot of boxes. It's not tracking content, but it's tracking a lot of things in aggregate, which is really valuable. Interaction in XPaint is a new Google metric that is going to be part of Core Web Vitals next year, and it measures a page's responsiveness to individual user interactions. And it reports a value that all or nearly all the interactions are below. What we find is really helpful, again, looking in the field, is that INP often does correlate to user behavior. 
and uh, again checks a lot of boxes it's not tracking content again it's um it's it's uh accessible out of the box and it can be correlated to user experience and business metrics so this is a quick cheat sheet um kind of showing a lot of the different metrics and how you can kind of maybe weight them in your own consideration these are just a good set of metrics as ideas and starting points for you. Some of them might work, all of them might work, maybe only one or two of them work. You really do need to test them on your own site, do some visual validation, and then, um, and then work from there. As I said, your mileage may vary. So what should, how do you determine what your budget threshold should be? Say you've determined what a great metric or handful of metrics is for your site, what numeric value should you apply to those budgets? It's really important to remember that your performance budgets are not the same as your performance goals. A goal is aspirational. How fast do you want to be? A budget is really pragmatic. It's you want to use your budget to keep your site from getting slower while you work towards your goals. So here you can see a time series chart with this, the time series showing the actual behavior of the metric over time. You can see a goal two seconds. Um, this is for largest contentful paint. So, uh, sorry, 2.5 seconds. That's Google's threshold for, for good LCP. Um, so that's your aspirational um, goal. Uh, your budget is your worst performing day. You can see that we've selected um, about 8.64 seconds. And the reason why you want to select that worst performing day is you set a budget against that, then you're going to get alerted anytime you get worse than that. You don't want to get worse while you're trying to make things better. If you just had a, a goal as your budget, this is what that same chart would look like. You wouldn't get any alerts, you just always be in the red. And the problem with that is it is very demoralizing, it's not actionable, and it's very ignorable. This is not a helpful chart and it's not a helpful way to think about a performance budget. As you optimize your pages and hopefully get that faster, then you can update your budgets. So hopefully, going back to this chart right here, you know, maybe you get your, your load time down to 2.5 seconds, which is amazing. Then you adjust your budget to 2.5 seconds and you get alerted so you don't get worse. So the idea is that you are managing your budget progressively. A common question that I get asked is, should I set up my budgets in RUM or synthetic or both? Well, there's a few different scenarios and it really depends on what your goals are. You can create performance budgets in RUM and then drill down via synthetic if you're tracking RUM and synthetic data within the same tool. And what that looks like is this. Um, if you're wondering why the two lines for RUM and synthetic look different in this time series, it's because synthetic is, RUM is really your single source of truth for how your pages are actually behaving in the wild. Synthetic is just a snapshot. You're tracking synthetic merely to give yourself a baseline and to give yourself the ability to drill down into your um, very detailed synthetic test results. So you can get alerted if you go out of bounds on your RUM data, and then you can look at your companion synthetic data for the same page and figure out, okay, well, what went wrong? Another scenario is you can create budgets in synthetic and integrate with your CI CD process. So for example, uh, BBC News, they had a speed index budget uh, that, and they 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 um, fell below it and crossed the threshold, and so they got an alert in Slack. Um, do you need performance budgets for all your pages? No, you don't. In fact, that's again we're getting back to the minimum viable budget idea. Um, Often people think they need to focus on their home page, but in other studies that I've done on using RUM data, the pages that actually matter the most for conversion are your product and category pages, or if you run a media site or an informational site, your article pages and your, your department pages. Home is definitely important, but cart search kind of fall below that. Who should be responsible for managing budgets is a really big question. Um, this is a really disgusting picture. <laughs> it's very disturbing. Um, but I use this to illustrate that really everyone who touches a page, that's, that's meant to be everyone who touches a page, there's a lot of fingers, uh, should understand the performance impact of their choices. And yes, this includes your marketing teams. 
for some reason, people think marketing teams should be siloed somewhere else. And, you know, um, but no, they should be very aware. For example, if your marketing team is responsible for adding and maintaining your third party tags, they should understand the metrics that third parties can affect, like long task time. They should collaborate on setting the budget. They should receive alerts when the budget's violated. And they should definitely participate or at least have some visibility in identifying and fixing the issue. So some things to, I want you to remember, some important takeaways is to start small, even a single metric if you're starting out is great. Make sure that you're visually validating your metrics as you go, using film strips and videos so that you can actually see that the metric correlates to something real in the viewport. Validate your metrics some more. If you have access to your run data, see how the metrics correlate to user experience metrics like bounce rate or time on site or business metrics like conversions or revenue. Make sure you're getting buy-in from different stakeholders throughout your organization. Focus on the pages that matter most and revisit your budgets regularly, at least every four weeks. Remember that the metrics are always evolving. The metrics that work today might be um, obsolete in a year or two, and that's not just because we are, you know, kind of flash in the pan people in the performance industry. We're always working to fine tune the metrics and make our metrics better. So the metrics you use now might be obsolete in a few years. And the most important thing is just never stop measuring. Measure consistently, measure over time. Thank you very much. I hope that this was helpful. Please find me online in all of these places and I look forward to connecting with you. Thanks again.